Good morning, good morning. It's been a while. I've been doing loads of road works. I think I can finally go the windy bend way. How are you? All right? Good? I'll have a walnuts off my tree soon. If some other bugger doesn't have them off first. <coughs> oh, that doesn't sound good, does it? Uh, it's funny because I don't smoke and I've never smoked. I had a day off yesterday, I had a, an appointment, and I jumped out of bed really early, jumped in the shower, got dressed, I was just about to open the door and step out, and my wife said, you do know you're not going to work, don't you? And I said, oh yeah, I got up like an hour and a half before I needed to, just because it's such a routine, you know? You do it every day. I suppose I've been doing it every day for, I don't know, 40 years. So, it sort of becomes second nature, doesn't it? Every motion, every every movement, that just becomes part of a very long routine that culminates with you ending up at work. I've come to a major decision today, though, which is that I'm not going to have tea in the morning, I'm going to have coffee. Because... You know, I'm just drinking tea and I'm thinking, I know we all drink tea in this country and it's a tradition to drink tea and everything, but I just, it just feels like a big mug of hot water, milk, and, you know, something else, which doesn't taste all that nice. Perhaps I need to change my tea bags. Anyway, we're gonna go, but my, my wife, Mrs. Angry, said that when I'm on holiday, actually quite frequently, when I get up in the morning, I do have coffee. I don't have tea. And uh, and she's right. When I'm sort of free to more or less say what I fancy, I'll, I'll quite often have coffee. But then when I get up, when I'm on holiday, like I'll quite often have kippers or uh, um, you know fruit salad. Uh, with some uh, natural probiotic yogurt on it or something. I mean, I can't see that. I can't see that materialising in the angry household. So. Uh, anyway, work's going really well. You know. Uh, that, you know, gone are the days when I had like £16 in the bank. And uh, my cash flow problems were so bad thanks to uh, the 7,000 pounds that uh, His Majesty had off me, plus the other three for payroll taxes. So I just about survived the uh, 1st of July. So we're continuing to have, um, we're getting a, you may remember I put in a new lab my denture lab, because my denture technician went to work for Border Force, and uh, uh, he popped in the other day, as a matter of fact. But the, um, I mean, he's much better off working for Border Force than he ever was as a dental technician. I'll tell you that. You know, he's happier. He looks, he's, his mental health has improved. He's um, more relaxed. He does. They do four days and then three days. So basically you can be doing um, four days and then, what's he doing? Is there any reason why he had to put all these hazard flashes on to go in there? Could he just not have indicated right like a normal person? Yeah, so, so. <laughs> On the basis of that life is a nil-sum game, which I don't believe. I believe him leaving was good for him, and actually it's turned out to be good for us. So, uh, 
And why is it good for us? Well, the lab work is coming back quicker. I don't have to go and beg and say to him, look, can you do an ad today? Or can you do a, a special tray for tomorrow or something? We can just do it. And secondly, the quality of the work has actually improved quite a bit. Now, that's not to say that he was a bad technician. He wasn't. He wasn't the best technician. He was an average technician. You know, a well-meaning, hard-working technician who just paddled down the middle of the stream the best he could. And um, unfortunately, you know, he was brought down, as many dentists have been brought down, by the, the NHS dental system, which just rewards... I mean, you, it, it, you know, it will it will reward you for making a denture without any any concern as to the quality of that denture. So you've got the situation where people are uh, taking impressions, sending them to the lab, and saying, "Just can you send me back a denture?" No second impressions. No shade matching well probably one shade match no mold matching certainly no uh, bite no uh, try in just straight to fit and these are the compromises that uh, you when you're working down to a price these are the compromises that you start to come across uh, well they're necessarily enforced I would say on the profession by the by the system you know that dictates how they work set set by the Department of Health so Now what happens is if we need a bite, then it, it comes back as something approaching uh, the bite as it is in the patient's mouth. And that's not because we uh, see, because uh, we can guess the because we've seen the patient and therefore, therefore we know what the bite is. Although there may be a very tiny element of that, it's mainly because we spend a bit more time and care looking at the uh, jaws and the jaw relationships and and just sort of actually really sort of quite approximating quite well what, where we think the teeth used to be. So for example, even if the teeth don't quite meet, you know, if you still, if you haven't quite got enough teeth to do a bite, you can probably, with an articulator, with a simple hinge articulator, if you set the models up, you can just probably just put them roughly where you think they, they would be and then you do a bite on the, along those lines <coughs> and then uh, when it comes to the um, being in the surgery it's literally like two minutes work rather than half an hour carving the uh, the bite blocks in something that's uh, you know half reasonable so you know the special trays are we're doing more special trays because we can do them ourselves we are doing uh, mold matching. Now, mold matching is a fascinating science. And I would say, if you really wanted to improve your dentures, and I'm not talking, to, I'm not, unfortunately, if you're on the National Health Service, just put your fingers in your ears now, okay, because this really doesn't apply to you. But if you can just do some simple mold matching, you will get dentures that are so much better, so much better looking, you know, than the actual, the standard B2 mold that all technicians order because it's the only tooth they ever use, you know, it's the, it's the NHS denture tooth. And not, not, not an expensive mold either, you know, a very flat looking B2 shape, which is obviously the cheapest, you know, it's just the cheapest uh, of any reasonable quality, if you can call it reasonable quality. Um, uh, thank you. Kent County Council for setting the traffic lights so that they're always red, even though there's nothing. You saw that, didn't you? It changed to red. There's nothing the other side. No reason to change to red. Could have stayed at green, but no, changed to red slowed me down. Why? Because it just likes being red. Yeah, so, 
you know, if you've got patients with, uh, I don't know, some, some patients can have quite long rectangular incisors, etc., etc. <coughs> now, I know it's funny, the dentists of my age and experience, rediscovering the joys of mould matching at the end of my career, having, having promptly abandoned it at the beginning of my career. So, you know, okay, I'll take that on the chin. Okay, fair enough. But in my defense, you try and get a bloody technician to do some mold matching. You try and get them to order in a, a 25 pound set of teeth because they're only gonna use one of them. All right, bearing in mind how many was there's about, <coughs> let's say, <coughs> 15 shades and you get them to order in a certain mould and then use one now what's the chances of them needing that mould in that shade ever again that, that nil zero it just literally adds 25 pounds onto the onto the cost of the denture and uh, 50 if you include the back teeth and <coughs> It's just going to sit in their drawer and never, never ever be useful for anything. We've started to giving them to the patients now, the team, uh, because they're more used to the patients than they are to us. But, um, you know, they won't. They'll just look at you blankly. You know that sort of blank look that technicians have got, which mean, oh God, here we go. Something else I'm going to have to nod. And then, and then sl slowly hope that the dentist forgets. But uh, we've got into uh, mould matching and in a big way. And uh, uh, funnily enough, the uh, nurse and receptionist uh, quite like the idea as well. Um, what we've done is um, you can do it with a six inch ruler, you know, the sort of thing that you get in a basic algebra set if you want to, but we actually tend to do it with a uh, engineer's uh, calipers because you get that you get the precision is basically one decimal place <coughs> so you need to know whether it's 8.8 .8 or, or 9 or uh, 10 or 10.2 or whatever and you can't do that with a ruler really you need to have some you need to have a micrometer and it's good fun, you know, it's good fun uh, doing things properly, you know, doing things, now looking at a denture and thinking, actually, that looks really nice because the teeth are, they match completely in with the patient's real teeth. And as I say, the dentures, when you fit the dentures, they look really brilliant. Now, the other difference is that on the uh, trines and the setups, uh, all denture teeth, when they're sent to you, are too long. They, they, they've got too much base on them. It's all about the base. But don't worry. What you do is you get the denture teeth and you trim down the, the base so that if necessary, you've almost only got the occlusal surface and a bit of the buckle. And then you pop that on the, uh, the setup, the bite block. And then you then got to fiddle about so obviously all the teeth fit together, etc., etc. In, in, accordance with the principles of denture construction that you were taught as a student which is lower teeth over the ridge upper teeth can come slightly outside the ridge if necessary but lower teeth over the ridge and this is another thing you used to have to constantly shout in at the denture at uh, the technician can you put the lower teeth over the ridge they don't seem to understand this. They seem to want to put the teeth where is it easiest, best and easiest for them to articulate them rather than where they need to go and where they probably were anatomically. In short, there's a sort of a normalization of denture, dentures where every denture tends to tends towards like the average denture. Yeah? Every denture tends to be uh, it sort of drifts towards their this angles class one division one 
ideal, even though people's teeth are uh, extremely different. And, and really, in, in many ways, that ability to make a denture, which is extremely different, is the, is the hallmark, I would say, of a sort of a, a grand master of dentures, that I would ever aspire to such a lofty title. <coughs> However, um, I've got to, uh, I've got to the point where I've realised that, you know, whereas before I, I placed a lot of um, emphasis on uh, the correct articulation and uh, trying to sort of normalise the bite, uh, whereas in fact what I should have been doing is placing much more emphasis on uh, positioning the teeth correctly with regard to stability and as a result uh, getting it because I've actually discovered that the patients don't actually care much where the teeth are. They do care a bit about whether they look a bit horsey or whether they're showing enough teeth or etc etc. But as far as the back teeth go, you know, and, and quite often you get people with uh, where the lower back teeth have dropped right down. So you end up with um, the, lower, the lower teeth going along and then, and then dropping off the the cliff for about three millimeters and then continuing at a lower level and I would have worried about that when I had the technician but now I don't worry about it I do obviously make sure that they articulate but I'm not so worried unless it's a full fall about the lateral uh, excursions and the, and the um, anterior excursions so you know basically I've come to the reason that people just with dentists most just well, most of them leave them in the drawer, and then the rest of them just you chop up and down, you know. Then also, we've got a situation where the <clears throat> cobalt is a bit of a is increasingly becoming a bit of a hot potato. Not really because of dentures, but because of um, lab, uh, because of um, battery technology. You know, people are saying that it's. So mined in the Congo by child slaves, etc., etc., which I I do believe that. Um, and you know, to what extent should you have an ethical problem overfitting a cobalt chrome uh, to to, uh, to to a patient? Do, should you mention to them that, that, that there is an issue with the metal? Uh, should you stop doing them? If you stop doing them, what else do you do? You know. Um, if you grind, just to jump around a bit, if you grind the bottoms off these teeth and set them up, you can set them up and you don't touch the occlusal surfaces of the teeth. Certainly not until you're well past the trying stage. And then uh, what you do is you end up with a load of teeth. See, the technician's approach to this, right, is not to grind the base of the teeth. To set the, I mean, they do occasionally grind the bases of the teeth, but they basically they will prefer to set the teeth up and then close the jaw together and see if there's any discrepancies on the bite. <coughs> and then if they are, grind grind the tops of the teeth to get them to fit. Well, obviously you you and I can both spot the problem with that is that the patient then gets a set of dentures which is basically like it clapped out. You know, has got the equivalent of like ten years worth of wear on the biting surfaces before they're as you know as a new denture before they before they're even eating anything. But the technicians do it like that because that's quicker and simpler for them, and that's one of the um, advantages of getting rid of a technician is that you can get rid of them and they will then you then can stop doing things which are simpler and quicker. Uh, and do things which are uh, better for the patient and and more like the um, the textbook, you know. So uh, thank you, Miss Fletcher, my prosthetics teacher. I'm sure you're no longer with us, but uh, uh, Mr. Uh, oh, I can't remember. Light Lightman, Peter Lightman, I think, was the prosthetics teacher at UCH. <laughs> um, you know. And uh, Patterson, Mr. Patterson, who retired to the Isle of Wight, who I'm sure is no longer with us. Um, so, 
So, you know, get rid of your technician and step up your game. That's what I'd say. Now, okay, now, because I, you know, I'm, I'm obviously very honest with people about everything. So, I'm going to tell you there are some downsides. You know, the, the technicians spend a lot of time in the lab. You know, they're there Saturday morning sometimes. They're there till 10 o'clock sometimes. They're in at 6 o'clock sometimes. All this stuff does take time. And if you're going to be doing it yourself, I mean, obviously it's better if you can get someone to do it under your close personal supervision. So you still have a lab in the surgery. But you get, you know, if one of your nurses shows a real talent for it, and likes it and wants to do it, then there's no reason why they shouldn't do it. Uh, except that, you know, you're then gonna have one more salary. So instead of a lab bill, you've got a salary. And I suppose the salary is, uh, is more than a lab bill at the end of the day. But it does pay for itself. You know, if you're charging two, three thousand pounds for a set of dentures, part, part, uh, then, then fine. The other thing you can do is you can make the dentures much thinner. Um, you know, we send them out to be processed. I'd like to process them myself, but um, at the moment it's only practical for us to send them out to be processed. But um, if, um, you know, if someone is having trouble wearing a full upper acrylic, um, you can you can spend some time thin, thin, thinning out the palette, you know. You'll need to have like a wheel, a, a mop and a polishing thing to polish it all up. And uh, so you can send them back, you know, they have to go back looking professional. But uh, try asking a technician, try, try, when a technician gives you some dentures, can you, have you ever tried looking at them and saying actually that palette He's looking a bit thick. Do you think you could thin the palate a bit for me? You know. <coughs> I mean, that's that's half an hour's work, isn't it, for them? They're on a hide into nothing with that because they can't charge a fee for it. Oh, God, you could have crossed the road without a traffic light, couldn't you? I know there is a traffic light, but you could have crossed the road without a traffic light. What happened to the Tufty Club? Why don't people join that anymore? What happens to the Green Cross Code Man? So, all in all, I'll have to say it, there's sort of the medium point in our, uh, in our experiment. Um, bearing in mind, I mean, you cannot get a denture made anywhere around here within, you know, I mean, you're talking three months to get a denture made, even if a technician takes you on, and they're laughing, really, the technicians, you know, they won't take any on. You ring them up and say, are you taking on any, any work, then, I mean, it's all I can do just to get the chromes done at a lab. The chrome labs are still working, but then they've, they've pretty much always been private, you know, they're not, they, they, I don't know whether they really ever did much in the way of NHS chrome work. But on the negative side, you know, your, our, our attitude with our um, admin is that all the admin is done by the end of the day. So all the quotes have gone out by the end of the day, all the referral lists have gone out by the end of the day. <coughs> Hello. Then the next day you come in and, uh, and, and it's a new day, you know. And we're going to try and take the same attitude with the lab work. If someone needs uh, some cast poured up and a special tray made, it's going to get done, but hopefully before the end of the day. They're sucking something up, aren't they? What are they sucking? Oh, is it a concrete thing? Yeah, they're pumping. They're pumping concrete. <laughs> You've heard of pumping iron? Well, this is nothing like that. Anyway, that's uh, that's everything I can tell you about um, getting rid of your technician. I would think if you've got like a bit of a talent for or, or you're interested in quality and if you're if you work slow not if you're if you're still at the stage of your life where you're trying to put your kids through private school 
and you're, you know, you know, you're still like, hello, yes, thank you, thank you, Mrs. Er, goodbye, 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 yes, okay, thank you, goodbye. If you're still at that stage, then then it's not for you. But um, if you're not, you know, if you're and if you're interested in seeing far fewer patients making far more money off of far fewer patients, uh, then uh, then it's I'd say it's an excellent idea. Take it in house because the more you take in house, the more you're going to do to a very high standard. All right, talk to you soon. Bye.